Canada. And you're listening to Faith Radio. Welcome to Striking the Balance with Pastor Christian Toff, the radio ministry of Calvary Chapel, Panama City Beach, Florida. We're so glad you've joined us today on Striking the Balance. Our vision as we open up the Word of God is to strike the biblical balance as we teach book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Thanks again for joining us today, and we hope and pray that these messages help strengthen your walk with Jesus. Coming up on today's program, we're starting a brand new series through the book of Romans. We'll learn in today's introduction that the theme of the book is that we are made right with God through faith in Jesus Christ. Pastor Christian encourages us that if we desire to make a big impact in the world around us, we first have to experience revival in our own hearts and in our own homes. We must be faithful with the little first. And now, here's Pastor Christian. Actually, the New Testament is divided into three different parts. Okay, The first is the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So that's the first part. The second is the book of Acts, which includes Christ's ministry after, um, continues Christ's ministry through the apostles. And third, it's the epistles or the letters. And so these letters contains doctrine and teaching of the Christian faith. The book of Romans, what we're starting right now, we're starting the third part of the New Testament. Uh, The book of Romans is the first um, epistle that comes uh, in our Bible after the book of Acts. And so we kind of look at those three parts. We look at the Gospels, we look at the book of Acts, and then we look in the epistles. And so uh, the way we practice our Christianity is if we see it in the Gospels, and then we see that the first church thought it was necessary to continue practicing those things, and then we see in the epistles that the writers of the epistles continue writing about those things, then that's how we practice church today in 2024. So let me give you an example. Water baptism. So as you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the question is, do you see water baptism in the Gospels? The answer is yes. Then you look through the book of Acts, and you see people getting baptized in the book of Acts, and the answer is yes. Then you look through the epistles, and you see that they continue practicing that, and then you see that water baptism is taught about in the epistles. So therefore... We come to the conclusion at Calvary Chapel that we are going to be water baptizing people for obedience to God, not for salvation, but for obedience and for loving Jesus, what he's did on us. And we associate ourselves with this death, burial, and resurrection. Praise God for that. Okay, how about communion? We look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Do they take communion? Yes. We look in the book of Acts. Is communion there? In the 28 chapters? Yes. Then we look in the, in the, in the epistles. And then we see communion as a matter of fact, we're going to take communion today um, after service. The first Sunday of the month, we take communion together after service to remember that precious blood of Jesus that was shared on the cross for us. And the the bread, the body that was broken because he loves us so much. Uh, So, so excited about that. All right. What about foot washing? Do you see foot washing in the Gospels? Yes, Jesus washed feet, right? Do you see foot washing in the book of Acts? Um, I don't think so. (laughs) And do you see foot washings in the epistles? No. Therefore, we do not do foot washings for that reason. However, however, if... uh, So that's not like a regular thing. We don't have like monthly foot washing meetings, yearly foot washing meetings, weekly foot washing meetings. However, if the Lord speaks to you to wash somebody's feet, then we're obedient to them. So I'll give you an example where that might be appropriate. So you might be on a mission trip. Right, you're serving with other Christians. You're you're serving on the mission trip, but somehow, like the group is in the flesh, 
And you guys are like mad at each other and you're bickering and you're, you're fleshly and you're angry. And you're like, you're trying to witness for God and you're trying to be like full of the spirit, but you're like full of yourself <laughs> and what you want. And the Lord might speak to you and say, start washing these people's feet. Right? So if, if God tells you in that moment, then you just obey him. And uh, I know this happened to a friend of mine. And he actually started on the mission trip. And that's why I have the story. And so he started washing the, the church's feet. And then that's what it took for people to be like, oh my goodness, I'm so, I'm so selfish. I'm here to serve, but I'm actually like flesh, you know. And the God used that to change things around. However, we uh, break down the Bible through, um, through hermeneutics, the interpretation of the Bible. And that's how we interpret and that's how we, we practice our Christian faith. So foot washing, we don't practice foot washing. Um, unless the Lord tells you specifically, you believe the Lord told you, then be obedient to him. Okay, And then the list goes on and on and on. So the author of the book of Romans is the Apostle Paul, uh, formerly Saul of Tarsus, who was born uh, in Tarsus, which is a Roman uh, region. And because of that, he was able to be born a Roman citizen. That's why he was able to appeal to Caesar uh, as we just fin- concluded the, the book of Acts. And the writing of this letter, he actually wrote it when he was in Corinth. And we just studied that in the book of Acts when, when uh, Paul was in Corinth. And while he was in Corinth in Greece, he actually wrote to the church in Italy, in Rome. Because he had uh, friends that, were, that lived in, in Rome. And he had uh, people that came to faith. And so while he was in Greece, he wrote to the church in Italy, in Rome. Uh, the, the date of the writing is A.D. 57. So in A.D. 57, this is when this epistle, this letter was written. And the theme of this book, there's 16 chapters in the book of Romans. The theme of the, the book is righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. So this is what we're going to learn. And uh, this is what's going to transform our church. And this is what's going to transform our own, my own personal life is righteousness. We can be right. We can be right with God. Not on our goodness, but through faith. Righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the theme of the book. So this letter was written by uh, Apostle Paul to the church in Rome. Um, Like I said, he wrote this around AD 57 from the city of Corinth. At this point, Paul had never been to Rome, but he had long desired to go there. And we read in the last chapter of the book of Acts, which that was last week for us, that he finally got to go to Rome around AD 60 as a prisoner. So he finally gets to go to Rome for his first time three years after he writes this letter to the Romans. Paul obviously knew many of the Christians in Rome, and many were probably converted as a result of his ministry and in other places. The church in Rome was primarily made up of Gentiles, with some Jews mixed in. As Peter was called to minister to the Jews, Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles even though he was a Jew himself. Paul planned to go and to minister to the Gentiles and the Christians in Rome. So this letter was somewhat of a preparation for that visit. So this letter prepares, and three years later he goes, and he actually spends about two years with them in Rome, uh, teaching them about the Lord. He was encouraging and giving the Christians advanced training, preceding his personal ministry to them. The book of Romans is noted as being the most theological and systematic among all the books of the New Testament. Um, Some law schools actually use the book of Romans to teach their uh, students how to make an amazing argument, the best of the arguments. And so Paul was very learned. He was, he was probably one of the most learned men because he, he grew up as a Roman, so he's super well-versed. He's kind of like Moses. Remember, Moses was learning all the ways of the Egyptians, yet he, chose not, he didn't choose the passing pleasures of this world. He chose rather to suffer with the people of God rather than to enjoy the passing pleasures of what Egypt had to offer him. And so Paul was very learned in the Roman culture. He was very learned in the Greek culture. And he went to school and to university of the Hebrews. So he's very learned in the Hebrews. So he was just, he had like everything going for him. He was the cream of the crop, literally. Uh, he actually exceeded, even in, in his university, he, he exceeded uh, many of his companions. He was valedictorian in everything. And yet he says, all those things that were gained to me, I count them lost for the excellency of learning and knowing Jesus Christ. Actually, he says, I count these things as rubbish. All that learning and everything I had is just trash compared to Jesus. 
I just want Jesus. But God used all of that as he was able to relate and to persuade men and women to Christ. So the entire book explains to us the need of salvation. And that's why this book is so important, is salvation and how God is able to give us righteousness. Paul explains the purpose and need for the death of Jesus and the practical implications of the great doctrinal truths, including the unity of Jews and Gentiles that come by faith in Jesus Christ. So Paul's going to make an argument of the unity of the Jews and the Gentiles. The book of Romans uh, stands out because it's a vehicle that God uses to teach us about the, His glorious grace. And we see here, when we get to chapter 7, verse 24, it's a hopeless lament which says, O oh, wretched men that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Like, we want to do good. We're Christians. We, you know, and then as we're, God is using us and we're doing the right thing with God and with, with humans. And the next thing you know, then we do the wrong thing, right? Like somebody comes and they just really upset us so bad. Maybe somebody like broke a rule or didn't follow, uh, you know, the, the proper etiquette of how you're supposed to behave in a certain setting. And just that might make us just so upset. We're so upset. With somebody who, you know, who just is not following the rules. And then we sin by being so upset with them instead of being like godly towards them no matter what. And then we see that even though we're born again in the Spirit of God, we still have a nature, a fallen nature that's in us still. And, um, and that's, that's what Paul calls it, the body of death. We still have the body of death. This is still our war. And so we kind of realize, like, we can't be good enough on our own strength. We can't be good enough and perfect. Like, we still get upset. We still do all kinds of stuff. And then we're so bummed out with ourselves. Like, oh, how could I do that? Well, that's who we are. And, of course, we're going to do those things. So who's going to deliver me? Who's going to help me from this body of death? And so that's the hopeless plea. And then the turn of events is in Romans chapter 8. First of all, that says that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And so we get to understand God's amazing truth through the book of Romans as we discover who we are um, in Jesus and the victory that comes from this understanding. And then and later in, in Romans chapter 8, it says, if God is for us, who can be against us? This is just amazing and glorious. And then we are more than conquerors through Him. And so when you realize that, and you realize like, hey, somebody's breaking this rule, right? Maybe somebody's driving and there's the rules to driving, right? And they're like breaking the rule and they really did something to you that you're now, now you're in the flesh, right? So they sinned and now you sinned. <laughs> so you're both guilty. But who will deliver us? How can we not be those people who are just so easily influenced uh, by others? And uh, it's through, through Jesus Christ. And that's the victory in Romans chapter 8. So that's what revolutionizes us. But this morning, we're only going to cover chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. And I titled this message, Jesus in the Old Testament. And so let me read uh, verses 1 through 4. And we'll get into our study. It says, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So these, there's so much in there. We can't really go any farther because we have to unpack those first four verses, line by line, precept by precept, really understand um, as we make our way through the book of Romans, what this is telling us. So first of all, Paul, so he signs his name. When he wrote it, it was written on a scroll. So when you open the scroll, you have to open it all the way to see the back. So sometimes we write an email and we put our signature at the end. Well, because we write emails. But if you were to write in a scroll, you would put your name first so you can see who the letter's from. At the time that Paul wrote this epistle, it has been 25 years since Paul... Um, encountered Jesus on the road to the, uh, Damascus. Do you guys remember Paul's conversion? And so Paul, um, a, a bright light shone and he was knocked off his horse and basically Saul of Tarsus became uh, Paul. And so he became a Christian. He became born again. So now it's 25 years later and he's in Corinth and he's writing uh, this book. 
Now, some people talk about past experiences with the Lord. But our past experiences, if we're going to say what the Lord did in the 1970s, what the Lord did in 2005, what the Lord did in uh, 2015, if you want to be excited about what the Lord did, those, those experiences are only valid if they translate to today's walk, if you're today walking with Him. And so we can't just, oh, back in the day I was with the Lord, I was with the Lord. Well, that's cool. Like, what are you doing today? It's still the same Holy Spirit, and God wants to work today. And He's not changing what He wants to do. So it's really important that our stories and our experience with the Lord are fresh. And, you know, we come up to each other and like, look what the Lord did this week. Look what the Lord did this week. Let me tell I haven't seen you guys for a week. Let me tell you what the Lord did this week. You know, that's, that's a fresh relationship with the Lord. You know, look what the Lord did in the 1990s. You know, we were boom, 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 boom. Okay, that's good. That's good. 1990s. Why did it stop? Well, if it stopped, repent, remember, and redo the first work so it can start up again. Uh, and so it's only good to talk about the 1990s if you also have a story from 2024. <laughs> if you don't have a story from 2024, what God's doing, then maybe don't tell me about the 90s. It's okay. It's good enough. What's he doing now? Because you can't tell me he stopped working. And so our past experiences are only as good as the fire in you still continues. I um, spoke to Pastor Chuck once, and uh, I was like so excited. I was like, Pastor Chuck, oh man, I wish I was alive in the 70s and the Jesus People revival. Um, and we have a little um, newsletter on the back, the blue. If you guys want to take in, and you'll see there, there's, uh, there's Pastor Chuck. And, you know, somebody was kind enough in our congregation to put that together. And uh, uh, Greg Laurie made a movie about the Jesus uh, revolution. And, um, and we're, we're a byproduct of that. That's, that's a ministry that impacted our life. That's a ministry that transformed us. That's a ministry that gave us victory over the flesh. It made us born again. It made us repent. And so we continue and to give that which was given to me, to us. Because to whom much is given, much is required. So we've been given a lot. We've been given the whole Bible. And we're able to see all of God's word. And so we have, uh, we have a, a huge responsibility to feed the sheep and to uh, teach people the word of God. Uh, because we believe there's a famine of the word of God in the land. Sometimes in churches, people are tempted to, um, to substitute the word of God for worship music. And worship music is amazing. We love it. But not when 90% to 95% of the time it's worship music and you never get into this. Because worship music could be doctrinally not sound. People could write the worship music. Uh, they never really read through the Bible. And so some of their ideas might actually not be biblical. Some Christian songs, they might not be biblical. There's, there's many examples, and I'm not going to go into that because that's, that's not my intention this morning. But God working in our lives today. He's still available to work through us and to bring revivals in our life. Someone once said that if you want to change the world... And we do. I want to change the world. I believe you do too. Go home and love your family. <laughs> Someone else once said, if you want a revival, and I do, draw a circle on the ground, step inside that circle and pray, God, revive what's in the circle. If you do that, revival will happen. Because God is speaking to each one of us. And sometimes I'm super stubborn. And God will tell you, Christian, this is what I want. And I'm like, no, God, I don't want to do that. I want to do this. You know, I want, I, want these, I want to do this. And he's like, no, I want you to do this. But no, I want to do things for you, God. I want to see people baptized. I want to see people saved. I want to see hundreds of people come to you. I want to see the church full. I want to see, come on, God, let's do it. Let's do it. And he's like, probably later. But right now, I want to change you. God, I'm fine. I'm, I'm already changed. Like, I'm already saved. Like, I'm good. Let's go after those other guys. And he's like, well, I want you to do this in your life. Do this one thing. Because this one thing is, you kind of treat it like it's better than me. You kind of treat it like I'm not enough. So I want, I want you to get rid of this in your life. But Lord, it's not even sinful, right? Like we know, it's not sinful. Like a bunch of people do it. And they'll say, well, others may, but you cannot. I'm asking you personally uh, to put this down. Other people can have freedoms to do those things. But I'm asking you to put it down. And then you finally put it down because he told you specifically something. Then all these like, 
amazing things happen. Like you see people come and ask you about the Lord. You see, you see those desires that you want. You see people getting saved. You have a conversation with people. You really get fired up from the Lord. But it was God's way. It was Him asking us to search our hearts to see if there's any wicked uh, thing left in us. And there's still so much. All our lives, there'll still be much. And it's a process that God is continuing to clean that wicked heart that's in there. Just like Matthew 6, 33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. But no, Lord, let's go get all these things. It's not about the things. It's about seeking first the kingdom. And then as you seek first, as I align my heart, then next thing you know, everything I wanted to do for Him starts happening naturally, without any sweat, without any effort. And then people come up, oh, you're so amazing, you're so this and so that. And you're like, the moment I believe that, I'm going to get sidelined because we're just obedient. We're not amazing. We're just obedient and we put those things down and we say, Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough for anything that I need him to be for me. So if you want to change the world, go home and love your family. The Lord is going to use you as you're faithful to the things that are right in front of you. If you're faithful in small things, then you're going to be faithful in big things. No, God, let's go do the big things. No, do the small things. And the same attitude that you have towards small things is the same attitude you're going to have over bigger things. No, but I want to skip all the small things. <laughs> uh-huh. I want to despise the day of small things. Lord, like, let's big. Come on. Three services. Thousands of people. And he's like, if you can't be faithful, you don't deserve anything. If you can't be faithful to what's in front of you, you will not be faithful over thousands of people. So... God is so good. Paul wrote this letter from the city of Corinth, as we mentioned. And it says who he is. Paul's definition of himself. This is how Paul describes himself in verse 1. It says, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. So what is a bondservant? Because if Paul is a bondservant, the Lord is calling us to be bondservants. That's the whole point of the Bible. It's not to just get into lecture knowledge. Like, oh, this is what Paul was. It's about like to take Paul's example. As he said, follow me as I follow Christ. So Paul was a bondservant. The Bible teaches we need to be bondservants. So, okay, let's, let's dive into what's a bondservant. A bondservant is one who is at the disposal of his master. That means the master can do whatever he wishes with the bondservants. That means our life are no longer our own. That means we're not the master of our own life anymore. We don't pick and choose how we want to live our life. right? We love America and we love the freedom to do whatever we want. Right? But Paul was more free, even though he was in chains next to a Roman soldier, than other people who were around him that were free to roam around, but they're really in, in chains spiritually. They're really slaves. So I just want to say we're either bond servants for Jesus Christ or we're bond servants for something else. There's no options. So if you say, oh, I don't want to be a servant. Well, if you don't serve Jesus, you're going to serve somebody or something. You're serving something. You're serving your flesh. You're serving the enemy. You're serving another person. Something is your master. So there's only one good master. Only Jesus is a good master. But all 8 billion people on the face of the earth are serving a master. And we're here to say we want to serve the word of God. We want to serve Jesus. Come in the flesh. God. We are his. We choose to be his. And we trust that He is able to protect us, to provide for us, to be everything we need Him to be. Even in our darkest moments, even in times of fear, He's able to get us through it. And He'll never leave you, He'll never forsake you. No other master can promise you that. So we're at Jesus' disposal. He's our master. Paul's one and only goal in life was to serve Jesus. That's what he woke up for. That's what he dreamed that night. When he woke up in the middle of the night, that's what he thought about. That's what he meditated on. That's what God wants us to be like. So this was Paul's identity. This is who, how he identifies. What, what is your identity? I identify as a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ. That means whatever it says here, it goes. And if I don't say it, if you don't say it, nobody's going to say it. That's my identity. That's Paul's identity. Thanks so much for joining us today on Striking the Balance with Pastor Christian Toff. We hope and pray that today's word was a blessing to your life and walk with the Lord. If you happen to miss any part of today's message or would like to hear more teachings from Pastor Christian, take a moment to explore our website, calvarypcb.com.
If you're looking for a home church, we extend a warm invitation for you to join us in person at Calvary Chapel, Panama City Beach. We meet Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. and Wednesday evenings at 6.30 p.m. Child care is provided at both services. For location and other info about our church, once again, our website is calvarypcb.com or you can email us at info at calvarypcb.com. We'd also love for you to connect with us on social media on both our Instagram and Facebook pages by searching for Calvary Chapel PCB. Your connection means a lot to us, whether here on Striking the Balance or online. And of course, we'd love the opportunity to worship Jesus with you in person. Thanks for listening today, and we hope you'll join us again next time on Striking the Balance. Striking the Balance is brought to you by Calvary Chapel, Panama City Beach.